the L8 micron divided by the total infrared luminosity. Uh, most of the time we only have an 8 micron point in this rare case. We have infrared luminosities, total infrared luminosity. So this is a quantity of interest uh, because the variation in this quantity tells you how wrong your models normally are. Um, and most models, um, or most of the time you can estimate LIR to within a factor of a few with an 8 micron point. There's this unfortunate very long tail here. Um, that corresponds roughly to the starburst mode Matt was talking about earlier. Uh, so the uncertainties when you only have one point of data can be large. Um, and this is just talking about the random uncertainties for bright galaxies. Um, you can actually take these same search Herschel data and try to do the same sort of analysis for very faint galaxies by stacking um, the undetections, the non-detections. And what you find is actually as you go to lower mass galaxies, this is from the Ring Chavez work, um, the L8 to LIR ratio changes not only randomly but systematically by about a factor of three. So low mass galaxies seem to behave very differently than high mass galaxies. And we already aren't very good at determining how high mass galaxies behave. So sort of the variation of IRSEDs, particularly at high redshift, is a significant source of uncertainty here. Um, another thing that's very uh, challenging to this uh, estimating the LIR from stars are AGN. Um, AGN emits significantly in the infrared, so this is a, um, a hydrodynamical uh, simulation, including radiative transfer um, of an AGN. This is all in 12 micron. And you see the AGN here in the center, this thick dust torus around the outside. The AGN will heat up the dust, and then the dust will emit in the exact same regime where we're trying to measure emission from stars. Um, so you see these two things get confused very often. Um, luckily, uh, AGN tend to heat dust to much higher temperatures, or so we normally think, than star formation, um, and that produces very distinct mid-infrared colors. And so it's been known for a long time that if you plot these mid-infrared color, color diagrams, AGN falls somewhere very <coughs> different than star-forming galaxies. And you can use those different colors to identify galaxies which are dominated by AGN emission. Um, you can go a step farther as well. If you've hit a full model to the SED, you can then um, assign a probabilistic categories and say this uh, galaxy probably has X percent of AGN contamination and give it a nice good error bar. So um, there are ways to sort of identify this emission pretty well. Um, but again, there are significant challenges too. Uh, oh, right. So first, uh, when you add this sort of AGN component, your SED models get much better. And that's because we're basically restoring energy balance. So um, for galaxies with significant AGN, you measure very different um, ages, dust properties, metal properties, and star formation rate properties when you add in this AGN model. Um, and so that sort of restores the energy balance we once had and allows us to measure accurate properties again. Um, the problem with these AGN models is uh, they're all very different. Uh, they haven't really talked to each other very well yet. Um, and so this uh, quote from an abstract of a paper last year, I think, uh, describes it pretty well. If you take the two most popular um, infrared AGN models, which are named Smooth and Clumpy, um, two great superheroes that model it out, um, you, per you basically put in the same match parameters, and you look at the outputs, um, they're very different. Uh, they have very different 10 micron features here. Um, Smooth has much steeper 10 micron features, Clumpy has very shallow ones. You also have a very different shape of the SED as a whole. Um, and so not only do the same parameters not give the same output SEDs, um, but there's no combination of random parameters that can be used to create the same output SEDs when trying to match one to the other. So there's a lot of work that these models, I think, have to keep on going through before um, we get to the point where they're reliable and they give very consistent answers. Um, there's another problem with trying to do this modeling. Um, this is a plot from Mojigan. Uh, basically, um, when you look at the IR AGN population, they're often pretty clear to see in the infrared. You can use color color diagrams, SED modeling, whatever, to identify them. Um, but it's very hard to independently verify their existence because these AGN selection criteria are sort of these moderately overlapping Venn diagrams. Um, they don't often agree, so it's hard to double check the presence of these um, photometrically identified AGN in the infrared by using other indicators. Um, <clears throat> yes, one, one thing Joel uh, obviously knows but uh, didn't mention is that here in the mid-IR there's kind of a poverty of 
densely sampled data. And we have WISE, we have Spitzer MIPS, uh, we have IRAS, but there's just not a lot of broadband data to sample the mid-IR SEDs. So in this regime, where the star formation begins to ramp up and where the AGNs are the strongest, there's not a lot of data points to discriminate among them. So that leads to a problem uh, which made me kind of suspicious when I saw, well, suspicious may be overstating, but made me uh, look twice at this paper which came out on AstroPH last week that claims to me measure AGN fractions by SED fitting using this template-based LeFar code. It's not an energy balance-based type code. It's, it matches templates uh, in the superposition to very high precision for very small AGN fractions in very large numbers of fairly faint galaxies just detected in the North Ecliptic Pole by, uh, with not a lot of bands, just mid-IR bands, so not no UV coverage. So these are some models uh, for a merger-based um, uh, IRAC detected sample being that was studied by uh, Eliza Beveridge, an RU student that Howard and I advised last year, uh, who's now uh, picking graduate schools and is now being led by Andres, uh, Andres Ram, uh, Ramos in Groningen. Um, so the point that I want to make is that um, it's difficult to model these complex phenomena with not very much data. That's my observational observation, uh, observer's hat. Um, the, uh, these things are commonly described as power laws because of this flattish behavior here. Uh, but if you look at the underlying star formation template, it's, it's not at all, uh, you know, this contribution is not at all a, um, a power law, yet contributes significantly. Uh, the AGN part is this, okay? Uh, if uh, Segal thinks that this black line approximate, the, approximates these points well, I would say that it's actually not that different from what's going on here, although Segal thinks there's a really deep absorption here and approximates, the, and models that SED with a really deep absorption feature here. It's a silicate 10 micron absorption in the, in the AGN. Okay, so maybe marginal evidence for that, but that's what we, that was our best fit SED in that case. Um, but uh, we're not the, only people who think that, um, besides Joel. Um, this is a, a figure from Laurie Chesla's paper, and she ought to know because she's one of the authors of the Sigal Code, um, where she constructed some mock AGN plus star formation galaxies and tried to model them with Sigal. So she used different templates than, than the Sigal templates so that there wasn't like a tautology going on there. And, uh, and the, the upshot is that it does pretty good measuring um, the stellar masses uh, overall. Uh, it, it's not bad measuring the star formation rates, although it's, it, it under predicts by and large. Um, for high AGN fractions, it does okay, but for if you get below 20%, it just can't do it. it. There's just not enough uh, information in the data for you to pull out a reliable AGN fraction when you get to when you get to weak AGNs. You can't really do it. Okay. Uh, so that was one of the points. An another point of this paper was that you, it's hopeless if you don't have the far IR and the submillimeter photometry because you need that part to constrain the star formation part. In the interest of time, I think we'll largely skip this, except to note that it's very common to turn the infrared luminosity directly into the star formation rate, because young stars are the most luminous part of the galaxy. However, please go on. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this, because it's kind of an observer's tour de force. Um, two minutes? Okay. Uh, <laughs> This is a completely different approach to modeling the SED of a galaxy. And this is actually really hard to do 
because this is it's a very bright galaxy, so it's easy in terms of signal to noise. But it's so big, it's actually hard to do it properly. Um, the innovation that Vianne et al. did was they used these uh, they used these obvious dust lanes as traced in the Galax imaging of this thing to construct an accurate 3D uh, an accurate model of the dust. So dust lanes with gaps, um, and then they transform that into a, a 2D space. So they actually have a 3D model, not just a, an ALDAS model of the energy generation and attenuation in this system. And they populated it with different stellar uh, populations. Uh, and then this is what they get. Boy, I'm really uh, summarizing. The, the evolved stars from the bulge and the disk generate the bulk of the heating of the dust. That's kind of a surprising conclusion. I remember when, before Spitzer launched, it was really not conventional wisdom at all that the old stars could contribute to the thermal fire IR heating of the dust. That was not conventional wisdom. As far as I know, nobody told me, um, but it's, it's clear that that can happen. All right, I did that in less than two minutes. Uh, this, this is another case. <laughs> There's another case where we see the same thing, although the, the figure isn't as good, and the, the number is smaller, 40% of the uh, heating and the thermal fire are, comes from the, from the established stellar populations. So you can't just read out the thermal fire IR uh, and assume that it's due to star formation. It can be AGNs, it can be from the old stars. Oh, 